All right, so let's start with another word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you so much that we can meet here and learn about these things. And Lord, that despite all the, the craziness in the world, that we do not need to fear. We just need to keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus and go wherever he leads us. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we're going to be talking about the subject of natural remedies for the colds, flus, and pandemics. How many of you here are doing natural remedies at home? What kind of natural remedies are you doing? Can you just yell some out? Ginger and garlic tea. Great. With lemon juice. Very good. Ginger and garlic tea for, and lemon juice. Okay, anyone else? Ginger, turmeric, and lemon. Very good. Other, what is the first thing you do when you get sick? Uh, stop eating. Stop eating. Oh, yeah, that's not a bad idea. That's actually what the Spirit of Prophecy says. Uh, you chew out the thing, uh, yes. Drink extra fluids. Drink Yes. Yes, praise the Lord. That's good. Actually, we, we have a lecture on that, too, about how sickness begins in the gut and how to eat. I have a lecture on how to eat. Um, any, anyone else? What other remedies are you doing? Well, we've heard some really good ones. How many of you here are doing hydrotherapy? Like, um hot and cold types of thing, hot and cold showers and saunas and this type of thing, hot foot baths. Anyone doing a hot foot bath? How many of you, as you're listening to me, are not doing any natural remedies hardly? Okay, good, good. So this is like a new thing, and uh, so I'm glad that you're here. Okay, before we start, I just want to share again. Some people were asking, you know, where they can learn more information and this kind of thing. Um, we have an online course at autoimmunerecoveryplan.com, and that will go over with you how to cook some of the recipes. We have a seven-day meal plan so that you know what seven days of breakfast and lunch look like. And uh, we have videos that show you how to do these things, as well as the science behind what we do. And that's at the Autoimmune Recovery Plan. That's one website that you can go to. That's a course that you can take that's ongoing. Our other course is at medmissionary.com. This is for Seventh-day Adventists, mostly, who are wanting to learn how to do this, so it's a lot of the same information as the autoimmune recovery plan, but it is a six-week course. And so we are there live with you for two hours every Sunday morning um, for six weeks, and we are going through this information with you for you to learn to implement in your own lifestyle so that you can go and help other people. And so we also you know, teach you kind of how to implement this as if you want to be a health coach and, and this type of thing. This is for um, people who want to do this. A lot of people take this to learn how to be a medical missionary. And then as they implement this, they are like, wow, I didn't know that I had my own health problems. And now I'm finding that I feel better when I do this. And so that's at medmissionary.com. And then our third website is wholenessforlife.com. And this is where people can learn um, about the, the gospel plus the health message. We're trying to bring those together at wholenessforlife.com. And this is our YouTube channel. Again, um, every Sabbath we're there at 5 p.m. Central Standard Time, which is 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So every Sabbath, not every Sabbath, because we're here this Sabbath, <laughs> and so we're not there this Sabbath, but uh, n normally we're there every, every Sabbath at 5 p.m. So, um, an understanding of disease. I read this to you this morning. Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. In case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained. That's a biblical concept, isn't it? That the cause should be ascertained. Do you know where we find that? That's in that's Proverbs. 
Proverbs chapter, let's see, let's see if we can find it. Uh, Proverbs chapter 26. Let's turn to Proverbs chapter 26, verse 2. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 2. I think this is an important concept for us to, to understand. It's in the Bible. It says this, As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. What does that tell you? When we see the curse happening, we should look for a cause. Now, what do we see happening nowadays? Did you know that in the last two years, there has been an increase in overall death all over the world of about 16 to 20%? There are 16 to 20 percent more deaths in the world that are not attributable directly to COVID. Did you know that that is catastrophic? And what is happening is that uh, the world is saying this is happening, and what we need to do is we need to find new medications, <laughs> or I. You know, usually that's what it is. We, we're going to find a new therapy. Is that according to the Bible? The Bible says what? When you see a curse happening, what should you do? Should you throw a medication at it? You should look for the cause. You should look for the cause. Why? Because when you see a curse, there is a cause. The curse does not come without a cause. Amen? Amen. And this is what we find in regards to disease. When you see disease, you should look for the cause. You should look for the violation in health. Now, in case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained. Unhealthful conditions should be changed. Wrong habits corrected. Then nature is to be assisted in her effort to expel impurities and to reestablish right conditions in the system. Um, I remember visiting a small country church, and it was a very small church, and everybody there, they were saying, pray for sister, sister uh, this, she has cancer, she's in the hospital, pray for this sister, she just had a stroke, she's in the hospital, this other sister is undergoing chemotherapy. Almost every single person was having a health problem. And uh, my, I was so sad because it was as if we, as Seventh-day Adventists, we think just because we're getting older that cancer is just a regular thing now that we have to expect. Or bad health is something that we just have to expect. Amen? You see that happening, right? And we, as God's people, we want to look for the cause. So I was praying about what to do, and I asked the, one of the church elders, I said, do you think your church would be interested in learning natural remedies, what to do for uh, you know, the pandemic and the cold and this kind of thing? And he said, yes. So I spent two weekends there. One weekend I shared with them this material for natural remedies. And then another weekend I spent there just teaching people how to eat. And after that, uh, I went back and visited the church, and one gentleman who had been on two or three medications for blood pressure, he said, oh, you know, I'm, now it's been about a month or two since he's been doing this. He's off of his blood pressure meds, and he is feeling more energy, and he's losing weight. I had another gentleman come up to me and say, you know, ever since you spoke, I stopped drinking soda. I decided instead of drinking soda or juice, I'm just going to drink water. And he's like, I'm losing a lot of weight. And he said, I used to have to, you know, when I would walk from the church to my car in the parking lot, I would get so winded, I'd have to stop to rest. He said, I don't have to do that anymore. And this was a farmer. He was in his, I think he's in his 60s, so not very old. Too young to be getting winded to walk from the church to the car, don't you think? And then another lady had had lymphoma, and she um, had gone through chemotherapy, and the lymphoma was coming back. 
and she was having terrible abdominal pain. She said just getting up in the morning to get out of bed, she'd have to take medications. She was in so much pain. And she said, since I started eating plant-based, because she had come into the church, she didn't know about the health message. She was married to a man who's not a, a, a Christian. And so they were eating still flesh foods and this kind of thing. She said, now that I'm starting to just eat plants and this kind of thing, she said, my pain went away. I don't have to take the pain medications. And, and so we were getting story after story from this tiny little church. Isn't that amazing? Just how little things like this can make a difference. And so it, we, when we see each other getting sick, we want to be praying for each other and asking each other, brother or sister, what can we do to ascertain the cause? And how can we fix this problem? Amen? Now, it says here, I'm sorry the, the writing is so little. It says, drugs never cure disease. They only change its form and location. Do you believe that? So when you take a drug, your blood pressure may come down. You will have probably another symptom, though. We call that a side effect. Right? The other thing that happens when you take a drug is that because your body kind of gets used to the effect that the drug has on it, it will have another mechanism to kind of fight against what that drug is trying to do. And so you will develop tolerance, meaning that that drug will no longer have the same effect. You'll probably need more of that drug or you'll need other drugs. And you'll also depend, develop dependence. That means your body's not able to do what it needs to do unless the drug is there. So um, when Sister White wrote this, she wrote this over 100 years ago, was she simply referring to the drugs of her day? Were they so bad and we have better drugs? I don't believe so. Because um, the drugs that she's talking about back then, we're finding out the drugs of today have the same problems as far as side effects, dependence, and tolerance. And when drugs are introduced into the system, for a time they may seem to have a beneficial effect, a change may take place, but the disease is not cured. When you take a blood pressure medicine, is your disease cured? I cannot tell you how many people I ask, do you have high blood pressure? They say, yes, but I'm on a blood pressure medicine. And they believe that means that their, med their, their problem is cured. It is not the case. So it will manifest in some other form. The disease which the drug was given to cure may disappear, but only to reappear in a new form, in a, such as in a skin disease ulcers, painful diseased joints, and sometimes a more dangerous and deadly form. Nature keeps struggling and the patient suffers with different ailments until there is a sudden breaking down in her efforts and death follows. So brothers and sisters, I really believe this, this quote is very applicable to the drugs that we have today as well. Just because we've had over 100 years of research and development in new medications, it does not mean that these medications don't have the same effect. This very much the same as it used to be. Now, we are, you might be, con you might be convinced of this in terms of medications that they use for, uh, you know, cancer and arthritis and autoimmune conditions. But how about for when you just get the cold or the flu? How about just taking like a um, something to bring your temperature down, like Tylenol and this type of thing? And so I'd just like to share with you that um, God has a way for everything. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so as we are dealing with even simple things, I think that we want to keep in mind that we as Seventh-day Adventists, our message is not to promote safer drugs. That's 
something that the world is promoting. If you look at the very courageous people that there are who, are who have been speaking up in the last two years and saying there are safer drugs that will cure the curse, that that is not the message of Seventh-day Adventists. Th these are courageous people, but they don't know the health message. The message of Seventh-day Adventists is that God has an even better way than drugs. And it is even more powerful. And I want to share with you some stories with that. But before I do, let's look at some statistics. Uh, the CDC estimated, this was from 10 years ago, so I'm not sure what the, what the flu statistics are going to be. I think nowadays the data is so, you know, uh, confusing. It might be challenging to know. But even back uh, 10 years ago, the CD estimated, CDC estimated that the flu-associated um, flu deaths ranged from anywhere between 3,000 to 49,000. And it's really hard to know what the actual numbers are because they lumped both the flu and pneumonia together. And that's why it's confusing to know exactly how much does the flu contribute to actual death. Now, the reason that people are so concerned about the flu is because in 1918, we had one of the worst pandemics this world has ever seen. It was called the Spanish flu, and in Wikipedia, it was described as the greatest medical holocaust in history. It may have killed more people than Black Death. It is said that this flu killed more people in 24 weeks than AIDS has killed in 24 years, more in a year than Black Death killed in a century. The Spanish flu was an H1N1 virus, uh, it l this Spanish flu lasted from January 1918 to December of 1920 and affected around 27% of the world's population at that time. So in terms of the H1N1 characterization, you can see those um, red spikes and the, per the green hammers on top of this um, viral molecule here. So the clubs and the spikes, they change all the time. These are hemagglutinins and neuraminidases. These are um, virulence factors. They are things that help you identify what kind of uh, virus particle this is. And um, so they name these viruses according to uh, whether it's H1N1 or some other combination. There's 18 subtypes of hemagglutinins, nine different types of neuraminidases, and then you can combine them any such, such way. And so that's what they are trying to target when they make new vaccines for them every season, and that's why it's really difficult to come up with a vaccine for these viruses, because every season, this combination of hemagglutinins and neuraminidases is going to change. And how can you know what combination you're going to get that particular season? Now, the Spanish flu affected 30% of the world's population. 10 to 20% of those infected died. It's estimated between 50 to 130 million people died worldwide in the United States. 500,000 to 675,000 people died. It really did devastate communities because, um, you know, what was happening at that time was there was a war. A lot of our medical personnel were overseas fighting that war. And so here in the United States, uh, health care was provided for by people who are under training and, and this type of thing. People were dying at such high rates that grave diggers were unable to bury the dead. Um, they would have funerals where you could only have a funeral for like 10 minutes, and then the next people would have to come in to have a funeral for their family. Entire villages in Alaska were wiped out. 20% of Western Samoa died in two months. I have a friend, her mother, um, I think she's from Mexico or one of the countries down south, and she said that her mother, 
remembers that people were buried alive because people were so afraid of getting the Spanish flu that they would actually do that when people got sick. And because the hospitals were just being overrun with the Spanish flu, you would, they would take big warehouses and they would convert them into hospitals, um, makeshift hospitals where they would care for the sick. Here is a graph of total deaths in the US Army. And you can see that the total deaths was around 115,660. Not just the US Army, it was also the um, uh, Allied forces during the war. And so total deaths for the US Army, which is that small section up there on the left, and then the Allied forces total was 115,660. You can see that deaths from um, disease was about 55%. Deaths from battle were about 45%. And so disease contributed more to death than even battle did. Isn't that amazing? And so you can see the Spanish flu took 50 to 100 million lives. The avian flu, 1 to 4 million. Hong Kong flu, 1 million. And then the swine flu, about 18,000. Remember the swine flu? What a big scare that was. So um, in, in the 1990s, they went to Alaska, and they got they retrieved virus from bodies that were in the frozen uh, ground there in Alaska, and they were able to uh, study that virus, and they found that it originated in birds, it mutated to infect humans, it kills monkeys, ferrets, and mice, pigs get sick, but get, keep the virus and spread it. Some people actually believe that there's another story to the Spanish flu and what it actually was all about, and <coughs> They believe it has something to do with um, uh, also the medications that were being um, used at the time, aspirin, for instance. And so there may be other things other than just a virus that are implicated in the Spanish flu. And so that's something that you can look into and read about um, as far as uh, what may actually have contributed to this Spanish flu. There's always going to be another story than what we are learning, I think, from, um, from you know, mainstream media. And so I think it's, it's interesting to look at these things. Now, at the time of the Spanish flu, we had some Adventist lifestyle centers, just as we do today. And uh, they were treating people who had the Spanish flu. Um, and so at the end of the Spanish flu, when it was all over, Dr. Uh, William Rubel, who was the head of the health ministry department at the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, he asked these 10 different sanitariums for their data on um, treating people with the Spanish flu. And he compared them to the US Army. Of course, it's not exactly com comparable. You're going to have different kinds of patients and, and, and this type of thing. But um, this is what he did. Um, and they found that, well, I, I'm not sure if, yeah, at the time of the Spanish flu, that there were, let's see. 16% incidence of pneumonia on people here in the US Army. And then for outpatients at the Adventist um, sanitariums, it was about uh, 9%. And then for those in the live-in program for the sanitariums, the percentage was about, um, I think it was 1% there. And so then they started looking at death and they found that those in the US Army, about a 6% rate of death. And then those in the outpatient, about 4%. And those in the inpatient at the sanitariums, less than 1% um, death rate there. So they used to say there, was a, um, there were people who lived through this and told their story. There was a doctor at Wildwood. Do you remember his name? Baldwin? Dr. Burnell Baldwin? Do you remember him? Um, he 
when I went to Wildwood for a natural remedies seminar, he told us that when he was younger, he told us that his mother was picked up by the mayor of the town to take care of the mayor's daughter who had Spanish flu. So the, uh, Dr. Baldwin's mother would go and take care of this, this girl. And I just thought, that's so, that's so inspiring, isn't it? That God's people were not afraid to go help people during this time of this deadly flu. Isn't that amazing? I remember when COVID first started and there were people that really needed help and there were people, um, a lot of us were afraid to go and help people. And, uh, you know, in Luke, Jesus says that, you know, great earthquakes shall be in diverse places and famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall be there be from heaven. We're going to have more pestilences, aren't we? before Jesus comes. And the world is warning about it, right? The world is saying there are going to be more pandemics and more pestilences. And what are God's people going to do? Dr. Rubel, in this article, he wrote this, what shall Seventh-day Adventists do to be ready for such experiences? We have known from Bible teachings for many years that such times were coming. We have been told over and over again to prepare for these experiences by well-ordered lives and by securing such a preparation for service as would enable all our people to what? To minister to the sick and distressed in such a time. During this epidemic, every Seventh-day Adventist has had 10 times as many opportunities for service as he could fill if he had been ready for them. Isn't that sad? We could have had even more people helping during the time of Spanish flu if they'd been ready. What a chance for missionary endeavor and for practicing that pure religion and undefiled of which James speaks. Some, however, have been so fearful of contracting the disease that they have refrained from offering assistance to the distressed until the disease actually invaded their own families while others have exceeded their strength in ministry to the sick. So how many of you, when you read this, this is quite sobering, isn't it? God wants us to have courage to go and help people. And I'm not saying to be irresponsible about it. You know, we want to take precautions and we want to understand what it is that we're dealing with. But... There are things that God wants us to be able to be a blessing through these things. And so I, I really believe that as we are studying these things, to pray and ask the Lord for wisdom, what is it that he wants us to do? Now, um, everything that we're doing is based upon the laws of health, and I shared with you the acronym of wholeness, uh, water, habits, oxygen, love, environment, nutrition, exercise, sleep, and sunshine. These are the laws of health that need to be in place. Um, so now I'm going to go into some of these things and some of these remedies that are very, very important. Um, I'm starting out with the subject of vitamin D. And we know from studies that are coming out now that most of us are vitamin D deficient. How many of you have gotten your vitamin D levels checked? How many of you have never gotten your vitamin D levels checked? Yeah, I think it's a good thing to get checked. Um, I got my vitamin D levels checked about 10, 15 years ago, and I found out I was pretty low. I was around 17, 15, something like that. And for optimal health, you want it to be around 30 to 60 or something like that. And so um, I went into the sunshine and I found that even going into the sunshine, my vitamin D levels didn't go up very much. And it could be because I had a lot of inflammation going on. And so my vitamin D levels were being used up. And so I ended up taking some supplements. Um, but I think it's very helpful to look to see what your vitamin D levels are. Vitamin D is very important for the immune system, for integrity of the barrier function of your skin and intestinal lining. And the sunshine is very important for this. Now, 
some people don't get the sunshine that they need. And when we mention sunshine being an important part of their health, they say, well, I'm taking a lot of vitamin D. And so I just want to share with you, sunshine has important roles to play other than just for vitamin D. When people have blood sugar issues and high blood pressure problems, you know what really helps? Going out into the sunshine. I have a family member who's on insulin, and at times they have a difficulty really getting their blood sugar levels really good. And there was a time where you know their blood sugars would be like 300 after eating. And they were trying everything. They thought they thought that they were trying everything. They could improve upon their diet. I knew that. But they didn't want to change their diet very much. And so as a last ditch effort, I said, why don't you go outside into the sunshine and just take off your clothes and just make sure you expose as much of your body to the sun as possible. And they did that, and they sweat, and they came back into the house, and their blood sugar had dropped to 80-something. Mercy has worked with several people in South America who, of course, changed their diet and lifestyle, plus they made use of sunlight out there, and they were able to get off of insulin by um, implementing these things. And so if you are someone who is struggling with your blood pressure and your blood sugar and these types of things, Make sure during the summer and spring months, get out into the sunshine. Expose as much of your body as possible to the sunshine. It won't help just to get your face and the arms and that kind of thing as much as it will help. Get the sunlight on the areas of the body that especially need it. Like if you're a diabetic, to get the sun on your, your pancreas, for instance. And if you're having oral health issues, to open up your mouth and let the sun get into to your mouth and you know just the different areas of your body that, that need it. The, the light will open up the blood vessels and help the circulation to improve and that kind of thing. So sunlight is very important for things more than just for vitamin D. Now, exercise is also something that's very important. Uh, in a study that was done at Kaiser between January of to October of 2020, they found that those who were active for at least 150 minutes a week had significantly lower risk of hospitalization, ICU admission, and death after getting COVID-19 than those who were not as active. Isn't that amazing? So just getting outside for 10 minutes per week provided some protection. And so every little thing that you do to increase activity is gonna help decrease your risk of COVID and other health problems. Now, we really believe that nutrition is very important, and we promote a plant-based diet. We believe that this is the diet that God gave to us in the garden. Genesis chapter 1, verse 29 says, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. So these are grains, fruit, seeds, and nuts. You know, greens were not in our diet until after the fall, right? So greens came into the diet at this um, verse in Genesis 3, verse 18. It says, thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Prior to this, herbs of the field were for animal food. Yes, because I believe it might be because we were eating from the tree of life. And so once sin came into the world, there was no tree of life anymore. And there's something that's very healing about greens. How many of you are getting greens each and every day? Very good. So if you're not, make sure you're getting those greens. There's some controversy about this. Some people think that um, greens, there's controversy about everything, okay? But... Uh, we consider greens to be a vegetable, so we, we try to eat our vegetables and greens together. We try to eat our fruits together. So one meal we eat the fruits, and uh, one meal we're eating the, grain, the greens and the um, herbs. Now, there, this was a study that was done on um, 2,884 doctors and nurses exposed to COVID-19 patients. And it was looking at three different kinds of diets. It was looking at those on a plant-based diet, 
those on a pescatarian diet, which is a fish diet, and those on a ketogenic diet. And they found that those who were on a plant-based diet, they had a 73% lower risk of moderate to severe COVID. Those who were on a pescatarian diet had a 59% lower risk. And those who were on a ketogenic diet had a 48% higher risk of moderate to severe COVID. Isn't that interesting? What's a ketogenic diet? That would be a high fat, high protein diet, low carbs. And people find it very helpful for certain metabolic conditions like high blood pressure and diabetes and losing weight and this kind of thing. And so you might be surprised to know, well, why would it be associated with a higher risk of COVID? Um, some of these diets are good for short-term benefit, but you're shortchanging yourself for long-term benefit. Because what happens is that um, if you are getting animal foods into your diet, there are a lot of inflammatory mediators that you're introducing into your body. And inflammation is something that we really want to avoid. And so um, that might be one mechanism for, by which this all works. Now, the other thing is that the microbiome is very important. How many of you are familiar with this term microbiome? Simply means this family of bacteria, viruses, and fungi that are in your gut, on your skin, in your lungs, all over you. There's a whole family of bacteria, viruses, and fungi that live on you. And it should be very diverse. This is such a nice church, isn't it? Because we have a lot of diversity in this church and, and people are kind and loving and you know, you go to churches where it's all one ethnicity and you'll see certain strengths and weaknesses about this type of thing. This is, and this is the issue with the microbiome. The microbiome is actually better the more diverse that it is. And when you have a very narrow group of uh, bacteria, viruses, and fungi, it's not a healthy situation. It's, uh, um, and so that's why when you take probiotics, probiotic pills, those probiotics only contain a few sp a species of, of bacteria. And so it's going to narrow your microbiome. It's not going to be as diverse. And we don't know how long those last. And so you might develop some dependence upon the probiotics. The other thing about probiotics is that they are a high-risk GMO type of food. And so we would recommend that you improve your microbiome by growing your own foods, whether it's like sprouting your foods or having a small garden or growing some herbs on the patio, some way to get your microbiome diversified with interaction with the environment. Every time you go outside and you interact with the soil, you're improving your microbiome. Every time you interact with healthy people, you're improving your microbiome. And every time you are doing things that are going to build your health, um, what, does, what does Isaiah 58 say? For us to have good health, we have to go help other people, right? When we go help other people, that God will improve our own health, right? Isaiah 58, that's the medical missionary chapter. Right? So this is all a part of uh, improved health. So everything that's going to improve health is going to improve your microbiome. How many of you have sugar cravings? So a sugar craving could be an indication that your microbiome is not in good balance because what happens is that you feed the bacteria in here and then they start sending you messages. And a lot of these sugar cravings come from the wrong kind of bacteria and yeast that are calling out for sugar. And you think that's you, but that's actually something else down here. And so we want to get used to the brain being in charge and not just responding to the animal inside here, okay? So we want to feed the bacteria that are going to improve our health. And so that's why we're going to try to eat things that are going to uh, build up a microbiome that will want good things. 
Um, I just thought that this was interesting. I, I saw this. COVID-19 vaccine dampened the genomic diversity of SARS-CoV-2. And so uh, what that means is that the vaccine will decrease the diversity of the types of uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, antigen. And that causes there to be more of a, a risk of there being a virus that's going to escape and cause there to be more of this pandemic risk, I believe. And so I think it just illustrates that it's always good to have health practices and therapeutic practices that are going to increase diversity rather than decrease diversity. Now, this is another element that's very helpful for immune function, and that is zinc. How many of you are taking zinc? Because everyone's saying it's such an important thing to do. Now, zinc has a very central role in the immune function. It's an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. It will stabilize cell membranes, helps with the barrier function of the skin, and there's all kinds of diseases that can happen when we're deficient in zinc. Now, there are foods that are high in zinc, like legumes, nuts, seeds, pseudograins, and grains. So you can get zinc from food and eating a well-balanced diet. But for zinc to get into the cell, you need something that's called an ionophore. And here's an example of a good ionophore, quercetin. Um, I'm sure that if you're taking zinc, you're probably also taking some quercetin, like 500 milligrams BID, that type of thing. We actually don't recommend supplementation. We try to do everything with food, and so that's why our, our cookbook has a lot of these foods. It has all of these foods, except in the beginning, we're not using the nuts and the grains. So we just use the pseudograins and the seeds. We're soaking and sprouting to even increase the nutrient availability of these minerals. and. And then we're going to be getting ionophores in the form of uh, foods that are high in quercetin. Um, quercetin is anti-inflammatory, antihistaminic, antioxidant, anti-diabetic, anti-thrombotic. It improves bone mineral content. It's anti-cancer, anti-cataract. It has a gastrointestinal cytoprotective activity, and it improves healing time. So uh, we use we use quercetin quite a bit. Foods that are high in quercetin include apples, berries, uh, brassica vegetables, which are the cruciferous, uh, capers, grapes, onions, shallots, teas, and tomatoes, as well as many seeds, nuts, flowers, bark, and leaves. Onions have two times that of tea, three times that of apple, and 22.4 milligrams to 51.82 milligrams per medium-sized onion. So let's see. Here is a broth that you can make. Um, all you have to do is take an onion and boil it in three cups of water. You can add a little bit of salt to taste. You can add five cloves of garlic to it, and that would make an onion garlic broth. And you want to simmer it for only 20 minutes or so. If you go longer than that, it's going to be kind of a sweet taste. And so um, for infection, we would do one cup two times a day. For prevention, uh, one cup one time a day. You can drink it throughout the day. And uh, we found it to be very helpful for, for a lot of things, including leaky gut and uh, when you get acutely sick and this kind of thing, this might be one of the first things that you can do. Very easy to make an onion broth. Now, the other thing about this onion broth is that you can use it in an enema. Um, uh, we had a friend, and this friend had worked with Mercy in her, the Lifestyle Center. She actually had a mother who had um, kidney failure and was on dialysis. And when she started implementing this diet for her mother, her mother recovered kidney function. She was able to get off of dialysis. Isn't that amazing? Now, she couldn't stay off of dialysis for very long because her mother was not interested in this diet. And so she couldn't keep it up for her mother. So you really have to commit to this yourself. Yeah. Um, but it just it was just an amazing thing. Anyways, her mother got sick, ended up going to the hospital. 
and she had a lot of abdominal pain. She was hospitalized because she had an infection and they didn't know exactly where the infection was. Um, and she ended up getting septic. Do you know what it means when you're septic? It means that you have bacteria in the blood. And so she became, she was starting to lose, um, you know, coherence and that kind of thing. And um, the daughter was praying about what to do. And her daughter, one, I think it was a Tuesday morning, she was praying about what to do and she felt impressed to call Mercy. And she hadn't talked to Mercy in a while. So she called Mercy and Mercy said, well, if I were you, I would do an onion enema. But that would be if I were at home. If she's in the hospital, there's nothing you can do. But this daughter thought, you know, God impressed me to call Mercy. And so if that's the case, maybe I'll just pursue this and see how God can lead. So she went to the drugstore and got an enema bag. She got all the onion broth and everything together. And she went to the hospital. And she was praying, Lord, please allow me to have some time that I can do this enema for my mother without the nurse walking in on me. And um, guess what? She was able to do an enema for her mother. And um, her mother's white blood cell count had been 22,000 which is high. Usually it's like 5,000, 6,000. And um, the day after she did that enema for her mother, the next morning, the mother's white blood cell count went down to 17,500. And so she was so encouraged, she thought, I'm going to do an enema three times today. So she found time in the hospital to do an enema three times for her mother. And she asked the doctor, please, can you not do the antibiotics? Because my mom is on several IV antibiotics, and they're not working for her. And she signed a waiver, and they didn't do the antibiotics for her mother. And the next morning, her mother's white blood cell count was 11,000. It dropped again. And she was able to go home. And um, isn't that amazing how these things can work? So when, when I heard that, I thought, oh, that's an amazing thing. We share that in our med missionary community, and we had a lot of people who had, you know, even children that were sick, and they didn't know what else to do for, and they started doing some of these enemas and this type of thing. That young little boy that I shared with you, his story about the eczema and the eosinophilic esophagitis, one of the things that they did, the parents did, that they found very helpful was to do garlic broth enemas for that little boy. And they would do retention enemas. It was only a few cc's that they would do at a time. Um, but they found that to be very helpful. So you can drink this, and you can do enemas with this. Vitamin C is also very important. It's a good antiviral. It improves and decreases cytokines, which are inflammatory mediators. It reduces free radicals. And it attenuates, meaning that it softens the excessive activation of the immune response. So um, two to eight grams a day may reduce incidence and duration of respiratory infections. Uh, IV vitamin C may also help with reducing mortality, and it can have a, a synergistic effect with uh, quercetin. So where will you get vitamin C? From bell peppers, kiwis, strawberries, oranges, papayas, broccoli, tomato, kale, and snow peas. And from the citrus, where you get even more vitamin C than from the fruit itself is from the peel. And so if you get some organic lemons, organic oranges, you can blend this up with your smoothies and have a lot of vitamin C from that. Uh, now this is another food that is invaluable when you're getting sick, and that would be garlic. And some of you have mentioned doing garlic uh, teas, ginger teas. Um, what we do with garlic, one of the things that I do when I get sick is I will put raw garlic into everything. I will put raw garlic into avocados, and I will put that on my, my bread, and I make a gluten-free bread that um, I, I, I make you know, without um, anything from the, the store. It's not like a store-bought bread because we soak and sprout everything, so it's very easy for digestion, and I just put some garlic in the avocado and a little bit of salt and lemon and eat that like a guacamole and I put like 
three, four cloves of garlic in, and it's spicy, but it will really wake you up. <laughs> the other thing that we do is a garlic lemon drink. Two cloves of garlic in the juice of half of a lemon with four ounces of water. You blend it well, and then you can hardly taste the garlic. If you drink that with your meal, some people say that it helps them so that they don't even feel like they need their acid blocker. How many of you are taking acid blockers you know, for GERD or that kind of thing? So some people say that by drinking this lemon drink, that it really helps with those symptoms of, of um, acid, overactive acid production. Now, garlic is amazing. It's antiparasitic, antibacterial, antifungal. It has minerals in it. It has vitamins in it. It's anti-lipid, anti-hypertensive, anti-cancer, anti-thrombotic. And so you know how it is with um, COVID, whether you've had the vaccine or whether you've had COVID itself, that the spike protein might cause you to be at risk of having clots and that kind of thing. So if that's the case, you want to be doing a lot of garlic, a lot of um, uh, the lemon garlic drink. I would drink that with every single meal. And uh, I would try to get raw garlic in as much as possible. So the other thing about garlic is that it will block the viral entry into the cell. And there was a study that was done in silico, that means by computer. And they feel that according to this experiment, garlic may target and inhibit one of the main proteases of the SARS-CoV-2. And um, some of these studies, you know, we're just doing by computer. You can't do it by um, uh, in vivo, in people, that type of thing. But it's just interesting that they've looked at some of these food products and herbs to see how they may affect the structure of the SARS-CoV-2. Now, when you're using garlic, you want to crush and ch or chop the garlic because it will release an enzyme called alanase. And that enzyme will um, help with the formation of allicin from this allen. Just to make it really confusing, right? Everything starts with an A-L-L. Um, Allicin rapidly, rapidly breaks down to form a variety of organosulfur compounds. So basically what that's saying is this. The way that God has made some of these foods is that he's packaged it so that some of these active compounds are not going to be released until the food is broken down. Kind of like when something bites into it or you start cooking it. And what that allows is that allows the enzyme to come into contact with a, with a compound that when it's worked upon by the enzyme, it becomes active. So if you will break down the, the garlic um, and let it sit for 10 minutes, it will have more of this active compound. Um, what I do with garlic is this, and I'm going to share with you. Let me see what else I have for garlic. Um, Garlic is good for ear infections, it's good for a sinus congestion, it's good for infections. You can boil the garlic and you can use that to rinse your wounds. You can, um, what I'll do is I'll cut some garlic, I'll cut garlic in half, and then I will actually put tape around it so I don't lose it. But the cut area, it's gonna release organosulfur compounds, right, into the air. I'll put that in my ear if I'm having an earache and I put tape around it so I don't lose it. And those organosulfur compounds then come and they will help with the infection. You can also put uh, an onion that you cut in half, you heat it up for about 20 minutes in the oven and it becomes nice and warm. You can put that cut end of the onion, you can wrap it with a towel, you can put it right up against your ear. And a lot of people have said that that has helped with their kids who have ear infections and that type of thing. I will even put a cut garlic into my nostril when I'm having lots of congestion, and it will really cause you to drain out <laughs> a lot of things. So um, 
The other thing that I found very helpful about the onion is to do an onion poultice. How many of you have ever done an onion poultice? Yes. So what you can do is you, you would cut up the onion. You can either use it raw or you can heat it up a little bit so it gets soft. And then you wrap it in a towel. You put it in a dish towel. And then you put that towel on your chest. And that will help with respiratory tract infections. I had a, my little nephew, he would get sick. And um, one day I was visiting them, and he was coughing every three to five minutes. And he, because he was a little boy, he could sleep through his coughing. But all of us were staying up awake, right? And so like, um, in the middle of the night, I heard his mother you know, moving around. And I asked her, I said, do you want me to try to help? And she said, okay, you know, do whatever you need to do. So I went down and I heated up some onion and I put um, uh, it in a towel and I put it on his chest. And he didn't wake up. He doesn't like the smell of onion. So if I had done it while he was awake, it would not have been good. But he, um, he slept through that. Guess what happened? He stopped coughing right away. It was like a miracle. It was a miracle. Um, because my sister is a radiologist, and she was, she was, you know, supportive of the work that we were doing, but she didn't really have an experience with it. And I was really praying and asking the Lord to help my sister to see the truth about these remedies and the, the health message, you know? And so when I did this, you know, how do you think I felt when when I asked my sister, do you want me to help you? Do you think I was confident that this was going to work? You know what? I'm going to tell you something. I had tried onion poultice for myself, and it didn't work for me. And so I, I just thought, you know, Jesus, this is what you tell us to do. I'm going to pray. I'm going to leave the results in your hands. And so that's what I did. I made the onion poultice for my sister, put it on my nephew's chest, he stopped coughing for the next six hours. I was so scared. But then after that happened, I was like, hallelujah, Jesus, you answer prayers. And um, I had a talk with my sister about this. And she was like, yeah, Joyce, she said, if I had not seen this with my own eyes, I would not believe it. And she, we had to use the onion poultices for the next three nights or so. Well, one night she thought, oh, maybe it's all better. Maybe she was like, let's test it out. She didn't do the onion poultice, and he started coughing again. So we had to do it again. But isn't that amazing how, how amazingly miraculous these things can be? Now, it doesn't always work like that, and so we still have to move forward in faith. But, uh, yeah, for some of these things, it's just miraculous. When I got COVID, I got COVID, I have bad lungs, and uh, I have both obstruction and restrictive lung um, problems, and so my lungs are probably working at only like 70% capacity. And when I got COVID, I would have beat COVID within a couple days with these remedies, but what happened was I felt so good, I went to work and I didn't do the remedies. And I got up at 3.30 in the morning, I read my Bible, and I didn't do the remedies, I just went to work, and I worked all day, and, and then I, I was driving around doing these errands, and I was so cold, and I'd been up since 3.30, and it was late at night, and I found myself getting sick on the way home. And so if you do things like that, it doesn't work, okay? You have to, with these remedies, you have to really, really keep on doing them and be faithful with them. And I, I succumbed to COVID. And when I succumbed, it always goes into my lungs. And um, I developed fluid in my lungs really bad. And uh, I could hear it with the stethoscope. You could hear me gurgling. And uh, I didn't know what to do. Mercy came over, and she was with me for a week helping me. Oh, thank you, Mercy, for helping me. And um, one thing that we found really helped was to do hot bath. It was supposed to be a fever bath. I was scared of fever baths because I'd heard some stories. The fever baths can be serious things. But this ended up just being a hot bath. And I had to be really careful with the hot bath. Um, put myself in it, and I would keep the pulse ox on, you know, the pulse oximeter to measure your oxygen saturation. Because after 10 minutes in the hot bath, 
my oxygen would go down into the 80s, 70s, and I couldn't tolerate it. And so, but after a hot bath and then rinsing off with cold water, the fluid went out of my lungs. It was like one hot bath and the fluid was out of my lungs. You could hear me breathing again. Isn't that a miracle? You can either go to the hospital and be put on a lot of medications and this kind of thing, or before you get to that point, try doing some of these things, yeah? Try doing the, the um, garlic and the onion. Try doing the hot bath. Try doing the hot and cold shower. Try doing the hot foot bath. See what it does, because this can be miraculous. And so I would highly recommend that we get familiar with these things before we get sick. Because if you wait until you get sick to try these things, you'll be too scared. And you won't have the energy. And your kids will be too scared. They'll be like, what is this black drink that you're giving me? You know. So get them used to trying these new things. So this next thing that I'm going to talk to you about, charcoal. How many of you are using charcoal when you get sick? You know, like our brother was saying here, when you get sick, you want to give your body time to detoxify. And an easy way to do that would be to take some charcoal. So we recommend actually in our protocols to take one tablespoon of charcoal a day with some water. And so we do that before we go to sleep at night. So first thing when you get sick, you can just take some charcoal as well and see how that works for you. Um, Dr. Diane Burnett recommends taking the charcoal with some ginger. And so you could do that, but just to get the charcoal in there. Now, this is another thing that's super helpful is to do oregano oil inhalations. And so, you know, doing steam inhalations is very good when you have a respiratory tract infection. But when you add on top of that essential oils like oregano or eucalyptus that have antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal effect, it's even more powerful. I cannot tell you how many times, like, because I travel a lot, and sometimes I feel like, oh, I'm getting sick. And so one of the first things that I'll do, I will do an oregano oil inhalation. All you have to do is you just heat up some water in, um, in a saucepan. And, and then you just take, I take a spoon. I put a couple drops of oregano oil on it. I put the spoon into the boiling water. And then I breathe off of that spoon. And it's super potent. Or you can just put some drops of oregano oil into that um, a saucepan and just open up the cover and then just let the um, oregano oil in. You can put a towel over your head, something to direct the steam towards your, your um, face. You want to make sure that you don't make it too potent because it'll burn your skin then. It'll be very painful. Um, so you just want to be careful about it as you do it. And that's why you have to be careful with children when you're doing oregano oil inhalations. Maybe you can just like be in a small room, like a bathroom, and then you can put the oregano oil into that bathroom, like the, the pot, let, let the steam come out, and you can all breathe that together um, so that you know that your baby's not getting burned or anything like that. But um, this is super helpful. If you are getting sick, this is one of the first things that you can do. It'll give you energy. If you have like a lung problem, it's uh, very helpful. But any kind of infection, it will get this antiviral, antibacterial compound into your body and help with whatever it is that you have. You can also use the oregano oil, put one drop into a 12 ounce glass jar and then gargle with it. You know, if you're, you're interacting with people and um, you're not sure, do I have any virus particles that are getting into my nose and they're staying alive in there for a few days, you can just um, gargle with some oregano oil um, that's in, diluted in some water. Gargle every hour while you're awake for prevention gargle three to five times a day. It inhibits the virus entry into cells and blocks the virus to the cell fusion in the first place. Um, in this study, within one hour of exposure, this oregano oil would act upon the, the viral capsid, which is the uh, covering of the virus. I'm going to skip over this. Um, now, in the case of the coronavirus, they found that it was sensitive to heat and to um, pH. So heat has its own antiviral effect. 
that's why having a, a temperature is very helpful. And you might not want to take a medication that's going to bring your temperature down just so that you feel better. You want to work with your body's mechanisms. And so what we can do is we can actually induce higher body temperatures by doing like a sauna. So let me see if I, if I found like this, like a homemade do-it-yourself sauna. What you would do is you'd get a big pot of water. You'd put 16 cups of water with four drops of oregano, six drops of eucalyptus oil. Don't put too much oregano in because you're going to be in a small enclosed space that you're going to want to sweat. And if you have too much oregano, it'll burn your skin and you won't, it won't be a pleasant experience. So you place the pot next to a stool. You don't want it to be a plastic chair. Why? Because you're going to have heat and you don't want your plastic chair to melt, okay? So, so um, use some kind of canvas material or wood or that kind of thing. And then you would cover yourself. Now, what would be nice to do would be to cover yourself with first like a sheet and then plastic and then wool on top of that. But if all you have is like a plastic, you just do that too. Whatever it is that you have to insulate your environment so you would sit on the chair, you have your pot of steaming hot water here with some of that oregano oil, and you don't have to do the oregano oil, just steaming hot water is the most important thing. And then you cover yourself with something that's gonna insulate you and allow you to breathe in this steam. And then you sweat for 20 minutes. And that will increase your body temperature and then what you do is you take a cold shower and sh shower off all that sweat. Make sure to get the back of your neck. And that shower doesn't have to be very long. It can be um, Dr. B uh, well, Bruce Thompson, he's a physiotherapist from Australia. He says it only has to be six seconds of cold. So, you know, 30 seconds. If you can do 30 seconds of cold, I think that's even better. And then you would want to sleep for a good... 30 at least to 45 minutes. And when you do that, that is going to really boost up your immune response. So Bruce Thompson says that this has helped for dengue fever. It's helped for malaria. If you do this three days in a row, that he has seen that it has broken these things. So try that. The other thing that you can do would be to do anything to build up a sweat. So if you don't have exposure to uh, water to do the hydrotherapy that way, maybe you are in a sunny area. You could go outside with a blanket and sweat outside in the sunshine. If you have a, a wood stove or a fireplace, you can take a blanket and sweat in front of the fire. Anything that it will do to build up a sweat for 20 minutes. You only want to do it for 20 minutes, and then the same thing. You shower with ice cold water for um, you know, 15 to 30 seconds, and then go to sleep. Okay? So this is easy hydrotherapy, uh, and it's very good. He's, as I said, Bruce Thompson has said that it's been helpful for all kinds of things, including malaria and dengue, and even for um, dementias and uh, depressions and that type of thing. Now, this is another type of hydrotherapy that's very helpful. It's, it's just a hot foot bath. Who knew that a hot foot bath could be so valuable? And what a hot foot bath will do, you take a bucket and put your feet and legs in it up to your calf. Now, the higher up you go, I think, is better. But for these things, you want at least to hit your lower calf. You want a hot foot bath for that. And then you'd want some, um, like a kettle of hot water there to keep the water hot for 20 minutes. And then you're going to put a blanket around yourself and put an ice cold towel on your forehead. Can you tell me, how many of you have done a hot foot bath for yourself? What kind of things are you doing it for? You want to yell it out? Huh? Soreness, 
sort of. Well, I think like a, that would be okay, especially if you put some Epsom salt in and that kind of thing. But a hot foot bath is what they call a derivative type of therapy, meaning that when you open up the blood vessels of the feet, it causes the blood vessels up here to kind of shrink. And so you have blood that's going to be directed away from your other structures. And so if you are congested, if you have a sinus issue, if you have pelvic pain, um, you know, pain at that time of the month and that type of thing. If you have migraine headaches, it's very good. If you have a headache from caffeine withdrawal, so doing a hot foot bath can be very helpful for that. If you're trying to get off of caffeine, do a hot foot bath first thing in the morning. Try to prevent yourself from having a caffeine withdrawal headache. And uh, what you'll do then, at the end of the, the hot foot bath, you'll put ice cold water on your feet, and then you can rest for 30 to 45 minutes, okay? So I actually had a patient who had um, a serious problem after her eye surgery, and she had a lot of congestion and pain around her eye. And so I actually had her do a hot foot bath to help with the pain from the congestion and inflammation that she had. So, so if you have like, you know, other ulcerative colitis issues, this kind of thing, doing a hot foot bath can be very helpful. Epsom salt is good, you know, doing with a, a hot foot bath. It'll get the magnesium into yourself. And even doing a bath with Epsom salt, that can be very helpful. Um, doing a bath with Epsom salt might be good for people with endometriosis and that kind of pain. Mercy, when you, when you have people with endometriosis, do you just have them do a hot bath or do you have them do a hot bath with, with Epsom salt? So Mercy uses two cups of just real salt. Are you saying real salt like Celtic salt or um, not necessarily Epsom salt? You're just trying to get other minerals in there too. So... And then this is the kind of hydrotherapy that they were using at the sanitariums. They were doing hot and cold fomentations to the chest. How many of you have ever done hot and cold fomentations to the chest? So, uh, you know, there are a lot of videos on how to do this where you're applying hot, wet towels um, over dry towels so you don't burn yourself, but you're getting the heat from the hot, wet towel. Um, three minutes hot. 30 seconds cold, three minutes hot, 30 seconds cold, three minutes hot, 30 seconds cold, and you always end on cold. Now, that, uh, that is called hot and cold chest compresses. And like I said, I would look this up online to know exactly how to do it. Um, I think that's more helpful than me trying to show you here myself. But I've done this for people with bronchitis and pneumonia. It's very, very helpful. You can also do this with a charcoal poultice. Ellen White talks about using charcoal with um, hot and cold fomentations and that it potentiates the effect of this hydrotherapy. So this is just the onion poultice that we talked about. The other thing that you can do is you can use onion as an air freshener. You can cut the onion in half, put it around your bed, and then you're breathing in this onion, these organosulfur compounds. How many of you have ever done that? Yeah, it's very nice, isn't it? Onion earache remedy, I shared that with you. And so, you know, this would be a protocol for COVID as well as for other issues. Staying healthy with the principles of wholeness. Eat to live to glorify God. Be consistent with your diet and lifestyle. A plant-based diet is vitally important. And pray for wisdom. Isaiah 30, verse 21, God says that, that when we pray, that we will hear a voice saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. This is a quote from Selected Messages. Natural means used in accordance with God's will bring about what? Supernatural results. Remember I told you the story about my sister and uh, w what happened when, when we applied the onion poultice for my nephew? We ask for a miracle and the Lord directs the mind to some simple remedy. We ask to be kept from the pestilence that walketh in darkness, that is stalking with such power through the world, we are then to cooperate with God, observing the laws of health and life. You know, as we go into these difficult times that we have ahead, we're going to go through a lot more pestilences. I pray that we would be encouraged 
to live lives that are faithful to the Lord, that are asking the Lord to be faithful to us and to show us when we get into health situation, God, what is the way? What should we do? The Lord promises that he will direct our mind to a simple remedy. Just as he did Mercy's friend whose mother was in the hospital with the infection. You know, God directs our minds to these simple things, and it's amazing how amazingly they work. So I hope that you've learned some things that will help you when you, next time that you get sick, that you will start implementing right away. Um, I'll close with a prayer, and then we can have some questions and answers, and I'll ask Mercy to come up for that. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the way that you work, how simple your ways are, and just how powerful and effective they are. I know because you are the one that does the, the miracles, Lord, and you are the great physician. And so, Lord, we just want to tell you today, we trust in you, we put our faith in you, and we have faith, Lord, that despite all that is in the world, that, that you are going to lead us through this valley of the shadow of death. We have nothing to fear. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, uh, you want to take a break or anything, or do you want to ask any questions? Hmm? Uh, questions? Okay, Mercy, do you want to come up, and then people can ask some questions? Okay, do you, do you want a mic there, or how, how do you want to do the questions? Do you have a mic, or do you have a mic? Okay, so we'll bring a mic down, and uh, then you can raise your hand. Uh, who here has a question? Okay, this lady here. And you can ask a question, I'll repeat it then. Okay, so the question is, instead of doing raw garlic, can we do garlic capsules, garlic supplements? What do you have to say, Mercy? Uh, I think it's preferable to do fresh garlic. It's more potent. And, uh, and besides that, they, in the capsule, they probably put one-fourth of a garlic. So you need at least two, two garlics that we do every day, you know, at least once a day. And um, also very important that, uh, you know, the capsule has this plastic that uh, has chemicals. Even if it's vegan, but, uh, you know, it's not necessary when we have something that is potent, that is fresh. And, and can I share something with you? A lot of times we have been used to thinking of supplements the way that we do medicine. Yeah? So we're used to taking a supplement for this or that. And we are getting to a time where we cannot buy or sell. Mm -hmm. Right now, one of the biggest problems that they're saying is we're, for these kids with respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, they're like, the, the drugstore doesn't have the medication. Even the over-the-counter stuff, they're out of this. And we're having the same things in our OR. We're having supply chain issues. And so the more that we can learn how to do God's ways, the better, I think. And so if we get comfortable with, with just these very simple things that God directs us to, uh, I think that it will, it will serve us, you know, um, as we are going through these more difficult times where we're less dependent upon the system. And in addition to the sweets that you talked about, how do you stop eating so much sweets when you were eating them as a child? Okay, so the question is, um, how do you stop eating sweets? Oh, how do you stop eating sweets? Like getting over the addiction for children? I will do it gradually, you know, whatever you use, you use less. Let's say you use two tablespoons, you use one tablespoon, go less and less until you go one teaspoon, and then you, su you replace it for uh, some honey, and um, we also do some of the stevia, the real stevia, the green stevia, which is this, you know, the herb that you can use a little as a sweetener, sweetener also, uh, so to prevent, you know, so you won't get the, the sugar that is very, you know, that de depressing the immune system. And 
Um, the other thing that is helpful is to do a fast. When you fast, you reset your taste buds, you reset a lot of things in the body, and you'll find that after the fast, it either makes you so hungry or it has recalibrated certain things. Um, my my um, nephews like, you know, typical food that most of us like, and um, I, because they were struggling with something, um, I said, you know, why don't you guys try my food for a week? Um, and so they were like, okay, you know, they were willing to try it for a week. Usually, you know, anything for a limited amount of time you're okay with. And so as they were going through this week and they were eating this way, they found, oh, this is not bad. This is not bad. I can eat this. I can try this. And then, you know, at the end of the week, they celebrated. They were like, oh, let's have our favorite food again, and we want this for a breakfast. And uh, my sister just texted me, and she said, you know, we had their favorite food for breakfast. And at the end of the meal, one of them quietly said, mm this isn't as good as I remembered it to be. <laughs> and she was very grateful. You know, that's the way that the Lord had worked upon their taste buds. And as they were going through this week, the, they were talking to them about, this is why we're doing this. This is why we're doing this. And they were educating them about the impact that this would have on their health as well as their spirituality. And so all of these things were coming together for them. And so as you're dealing with children or even yourself, um, to, to go from different angles. You're going to learn some recipes that are tasty uh, still. Uh, you're going to be in an environment where all your food is that way. Because if you, if you have a, a little bit of healthy food here, but then you have restaurant food here, and it won't work, you know? So you have to you kind of go all in on this, be consistent, maybe fast a little bit before you do it, and pray a lot because this is a spiritual journey and and then educate so that your family as you're doing this that they are excited about the positive impact that this is going to have for them you know if there's if you have children and they're dealing with eczema or a rash or you know uh, you know warts or you know what i mean like little things that kids might still be dealing with um you can say, hey, let's try this and see if it helps. Oh, it's my turn. Um, thank you so much for all, everything you've shared. Um, I think I got lost with the garlic. Um, my question has to do with something else, but maybe before you jump into my question, just to uh, link it to the missing part, I, I didn't hear what the garlic was for or how it helped. Oh, so what part, like garlic at all? Garlic is antiviral, antibacterial. So, so when you first get sick, if you would include raw garlic in oh, your food, it's very helpful. Thank but you. you can also use it for the infection itself. Like if you have a, a um, your sinuses are clogged and that kind of thing, or your ear infection, you can cut the garlic in half so that you have an exposed end where the sulfur compounds are going to come out. You know how you can breathe in those sulfur compounds? Yeah. That, those sulfur compounds from the garlic as well as the onion have a healing effect because they're I, antiviral. I've always cooked garlic and onion, so I've never used raw garlic or oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. anything. So but cooked, I use cooked is helpful yeah. too, but the yeah. raw is going to have other health effects. Yeah. yeah. So my question is, oh, and I'm so happy she brought candy out because my, I have two kids. I have a 10-year-old and a 7-year-old, and they have like three or four bags, literally trash bags filled with candy that one of my mom friends took them trick-or-treating right, and right, they right. had that and it's just, it's a lot to deal with. Now they're with their dad, their dad doesn't care. So. Yes. But if it was me, I'd be like, okay, you're having this much candy today and this yes. much tomorrow. Yes. And then I love candy too, so it's a problem and there's right. nobody to tell me that. So because I say that, I have to watch my eating of candy and it's very hard to stop. Yes. Anyway, <laughs> I'm gonna get to my question. You talked about the, the foot um, uh, foot foot bath, thank you. The foot bath for a, to help with a headache. Are there other ways, um, is, is it mostly when you have a headache, it's better to deal with the feet, or are there other remedies that you have to deal with the head? I'm imagining it's a cycle, and mm -hmm. you know, the foot leads to whatever it is that's causing the headache, the virus, or, or what the, 
So you're yeah. thinking about something else besides the food, but for health Yeah, right? a remedy that has to do with your head rather than your foot. <laughs> or like, you know, you have a foot bath. Um, it, you know, I mean, you wash your head already, that doesn't help. But with the foot, I imagine you're trying to move around, you know, to move around. Move the blood around. Move the blood circulation or whatever it is, you know. Well, if people come to our lifestyle centers, we, you know, they come because they're drinking coffee, so then we come, they're going to have a headache. Yeah. So that's always the work. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You just put a 10, you know, five gallon bucket and put heat there and then cold towel. That's it. 10 minutes, the headache is gone. So we do it for two days and it's gone. I have not tried anything else for headaches because that works so well that, you know, you know, why trying something else? Yeah. And, but you might be referring to other kinds of headaches, right? And so, yeah. I don't know, like yeah. migraine headaches or migraine tension headaches. headaches tension headaches, tension headaches yes. or movement so, headaches. So, yeah. so it depends on what's causing these headaches. Um, like with migraine headaches, if it's because, some, sometimes, many times it's because of food sensitivities that have built up too. And so doing this type of diet can be very helpful. We, I know people who have a history of migraine headaches who don't have the migraine headaches after they start doing this kind of diet. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that if it's a tension headache, um, that could be because of like jaw problems like maybe if your teeth are not touching correctly, that's going to affect your spine. Anything that suspects your spine is going to affect your head positioning and this kind of thing. And so that is also going to be impacted by the food that you eat. So like I, for instance, because I have these tooth malocclusion issues, I have severe muscle problems. Yeah. And um, if uh, I eat yeah. a certain way, I'll have a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if I'm if I eat this way, I don't have I can yeah. get by so much better. I have much 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 less pain. Yeah, like I can chew more on my right than my left. Or right, you know, like right. So you will find that when your diet, if you're not eating the foods that you're sensitive to as much, it it will be so much less. Um, inflammation. Now, this is an immune response, and so you might think, well, I'm not eating very much of that. I'm only eating a tiny bit. But it's, since it's an immune response, even if you eat a tiny bit, it will have a large impact, and it will last for a long time. So you need to get it totally out of your system, usually. And so, the, you know, things like avoiding nightshades. If you have headaches, you might want to avoid tomatoes, eggplants, and and uh, potatoes, that might be helpful. Oh, I love potatoes, yeah. Okay. Yes, and so, so, so these, there are a lot of foods that people get sensitive to that cause inflammation. Yeah, for anyone with arthritis or pain issues, I would, I would tell them, do what we do with the, the, the cookbook and everything, um, but also get rid of the nightshades and see how that helps you. Yeah. What are nightshades? Nightshades are those vegetables I was telling you. Oh, the, the tomatoes. Potatoes, potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants. Oh, that's so funny. Bell peppers. Potatoes, potatoes, yeah. <laughs> All these foods that we love, you Thanks. know, but they can have high levels of compounds that cause inflammation. All right, thank you so much. Oh, um, those are avoid avoiding, but could you do the... Uh, a massage. Yeah, a you can do massage, massage, of course. You, you know, wet. if you do certain kinds of, a, you know, yeah. therapies, yeah. Uh, massage, you can do essential oils, like peppermint oil can if be you're helpful. you warm, could you do um, wet? It, I think when you said wet, I assumed you have your feet really warm and your head wet. Is that what you uh, cold, cold, cold. We usually put okay. a cold towel on the head okay. and hot for the, the feet. All right, thank you. Yes. And then I would also say, you know, for those of you who are struggling with sugar, some people try to do it where you take baby steps. I have not found that to be helpful. Um, so I used to have a chocolate addiction. And I was very happy when they said, oh, dark chocolate has all kinds of antioxidants in it. I was like, whoa, that's great. You know, maybe Sister White, you know, uh, she didn't know about this. And so... And so, like, I, I would eat some chocolate after my meal. 
But you know the way that sugar is. Sugar is a drug, and so like you develop tolerance. And so the I used to like just a little bit of sugar, and then that was okay. But then I found I needed more and more sugar to have that good effect. And so um, I had to stop buying chocolate. <coughs> you know, like I couldn't have chocolate in the house. My sister would come, and you know she'd see like I had gotten this chocolate from Hawaii. I, eat, I ate the whole box. To make sure that I didn't feel so bad, I would eat it this way. I would sometimes eat all the chocolate and not the nuts. So I'd have a pile of nuts in there. So I felt better that I wasn't eating the whole box of chocolates. I was just eating the chocolate. Um, sometimes I would eat the nuts and not just a little bit of the chocolate. So I have tons of chocolate sitting there. And, and then I'd feel better, but I would eat the whole thing. you know. And I... I just, you know, I had to give this up to the Lord and say, Lord, I cannot have this in the house, otherwise I will eat it. I can't have sorbet in the house, otherwise I will eat the whole thing. I have a problem with control. And, and anyways, this stuff is not helpful for me. It's addictive. You know anything that is addictive, it causes frontal lobe injury. Yeah, I do not want any, yeah, if, if you are addicted to food, it causes frontal lobe injury. They, they did a study on, kids who are addicted to internet gaming and found that they had like 20% shrinkage of the frontal lobe. And they found that the same effects will happen with any kind of addiction, whether it's gambling, pornography, or food. Do you want shrinkage of your frontal lobe? You know that Satan's frontal lobe is shrunk, right? So we do everything to build up the frontal lobe. So when people say, oh, I want coffee and I want to serve it in the church, and they think that we are being legalistic, I say, no, we are simply helping people to regain their willpower. That's what God wants to do. God wants you to give him your will. He can give it back to you so that you can become the person you were meant to be in control of your life, in control of your not life, and not ruled by your appetite and passions. Addiction. Amen? Yes. Any other questions? So perhaps we are done. So we have this simple rule. Uh, if it's not in the house, it's not in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, when I quit buying chocolate, I was so addicted that I would, I would start looking through my cupboards to see, did I hide any chocolate in here? You know, I was an addict, really, truly. And so it's okay. You go through that addiction and withdrawal and everything like that, and Jesus will help you. And then you'll get to a point where you don't miss it. And then you'll get to a point where you don't view it as your friend. Right now, you view it as your friend. Like, like people who, who smoke, they view the cigarette as their friend. And so we have to get rid of that paradigm. They have to view Jesus as their friend. This is the enemy. It wants to bring them death and not life. We have to get to the point where we love the things that bring us life and hate the things that bring us death, right? So that it's not like an exercise of, of um, you know, self-sacrifice or anything like that. It's like a joy. Amen? Thank you for helping us out today. I have a question. Um, I was helping in a different de departments, so I missed part of your um, testimony. You mentioned that you were very sick and then you couldn't be around like electronics and stuff. And so how did you get over that and how can you be around it now? Do you still do something? Is there something that we can, because everybody is surrounded Yes. With it. So when I was going through this, of course I had to avoid the EMFs because I could feel it. Um, I can still feel it when my health is not good, like I can, my hands will start burning and uh, that type of thing. Um, so what it showed to me is the effect of sin. You know the reason that you don't avoid sin is because you don't feel the effects of it right away, right? There's that verse in Ecclesiastes, do you know that verse in Ecclesiastes that said because it's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it with you real quick because I think it's just so potent. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. 
because you don't feel it right away, that's why we love all the stuff that brings us death. Because we ate it, it didn't hurt us, we didn't die. And so we're like, oh, that wasn't so bad. I'll do it more the next time. And so, but me, because I started feeling the effects of EMF, I was like, oh, this is really bad for me. Now that I can tolerate it, even though I know how bad it is, I still do it. Isn't that amazing, the way sin works? This is what happened that caused me to um, get bad, is that I had injury that just kept on going. And it, because my body's resources were going to try to heal this injury that wouldn't heal, I developed a systemic problem. My resources were being used up. And that's why when you eat foods that cause you inflammation and damage, and then your body is constantly going to try to heal the gut, now you're gonna have pain, cancer, allergies, all these things, because your resources are going to try to heal, try to do things that it could have gone to fighting other things for. You see what I'm saying? So what happened for me is that once, you know, uh, I figured out what to do here, I went to the dentist and I said, I need for you to do this. And once they did that, then the injury wasn't so bad, I, my body started healing, my face. And as my face and skin started healing, I was less sensitive, and I could tolerate more. And so, uh, it, you know, of course the diet and everything really helps because it helps me heal a lot faster, and I have, you know, less energy going to healing this. Um, so I'm able, all of these things put together have helped me to be able to continue working and, and that type of thing. But now, yeah, I can tolerate this and I don't feel the effects so much, uh, which is not so good in a way, but, but yeah, that's the way that it works. something that uh, drinking miso soup prevents you from absorbing the EMFs if well, you do yeah, it every single Well, yeah, there are day. things that you can do if you are sensitive to EMFs. There is clothing that you can wear. There are hats that you can wear that will protect you somewhat from the EMF. But my, my thing with EMF is this, like um, uh, when I would just hold on to this, it would come, I could feel it through my body. I could feel it in my arm and, and, and this kind of thing. So, so what you, ha you know, you can wear the clothing. It is soothing to wear some of these clothings. Um, and, you know, maybe to, to do things like clay and charcoal, that might be helpful to do. But the most important thing is you have to, uh, the reason that you get sensitive to the EMF is because you cannot, you're so weak, you're so debilitated. And so you have to build up the strength. And that's with the laws of health. So I'm not, I didn't ask for that reason. I asked because you know I know that those EMFs are no good. And just because we don't feel the effects doesn't mean that they don't um, um, affect yes. all of us. So I was just uh, questioning like how to prevent it. Yeah, so, so yeah. That, that's what, that's all that I know from my experience is that, you know, there is clothing that you can wear to protect yourself. You know, maybe you can take some of these supplements that might help with um, the effects of it. But um, the most important thing would probably be at night, turn your modem off. You know, don't sleep with your phone around you. Um, uh, you know, try to limit activity around it as much as possible. Don't live near a cell tower. If you live in the country, you're more, less likely to be exposed to some of these things than if you live in a close, like if you live in a suburb uh, or in an apartment, you're gonna have modems from everyone all around you. So that's even more EMF around you. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, okay. Uh, for those of you who are interested, we do have our cookbook here, and so you can come and take a look at it, and um, uh, it is $25 that we've been selling it for. It's our new one that has a no nightshade option, right? This is the, the new one. And so, um, yes, thank you so much. Any other questions, or are we, are we done? Yeah, I don't want to hold you too late, so... Okay, let's pray one more time. Uh, or, uh, Pastor Jonathan, did you want to speak or do anything? Thank you, everybody.
just want to say thank you so much once again. And friends, you know, we have moments like this uh, kind of as a, as, a, as a kickstart, as a reset. When I, one of the things I think is the most helpful um, in any time that you're trying to do something new or make a change is community, is having the support and accountability of a community. So as I look out here and I see all of us here, there really is no reason why we couldn't meet together regularly, monthly perhaps, um, share ideas, exchange recipes, and continue to encourage ourselves uh, in our health journeys. So we appreciate you guys coming, giving us this information. Um, but if we're going to live this out, it can't be just a once a year or every couple times a year thing. We're going to do it more regularly, right? So why don't we stand together as we pray? Uh, some of you are already planning to head home to a foot bath or something of that nature. But let's stand together as we pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for the wisdom that you have given to us. Um, it is truly amazing, Lord, the way that you have made us. David was right when he said we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And even in a broken, sinful world, you still have ways of helping us to work with the bodies you've given us to have the optimum health that we can have. Well, we recognize that we live in a world that is calibrated to distract us and divert us from you. And all of us are carrying some kind of injury, whether in our body or in our mind, which makes uh, knowing you more challenging than you intend it to be. Lord, this week as we face those challenges, whether that's an addiction that rears its ugly head, whether that's just a physical illness, even though we're doing the best we know how to do, we're still facing this illness, whether it's something emotional or social in our relationships, whatever obstacle we face, may we not lose heart, may we not get discouraged, may we not allow the enemy's whispering accusations to cause us to doubt you and to doubt your word and your plan for our life. May we know that if we continue to faithfully follow you, you will lead us beside still waters and you will lead us uh, to a place where our souls indeed and our bodies are restored. Thank you so much uh, for Dr. Joyce and uh, for Sister Mercy who came to share with us. Thank you for Janet and the team for organizing this. And as we leave here, may the blessing of your presence Go with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Tomorrow, what time? One o'clock. And we're going to be meet downstairs in the gym. Or we're going to meet up here first. Okay, we'll meet here first at, at 1, and then we'll go down at 2.30 for some food demonstrations. Great to see you. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow.